Thank you, Mayor Ben. Um, just uh, in, in starting, I want to say that uh, it is, uh, it's been an interesting year on the corporate front. Uh, it's uh, been a year of some ethical scandals of, uh, of uh, companies uh, searching for what the right thing to do uh, might be. We've seen CEOs uh, trash the competition in a public way on uh, the Internet. We've seen old guard companies that were really the, uh, the, the embodiment of uh, ethics take some very unpopular stands uh, against, uh, 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 against rivals and against um, folks who you would think uh, should be left alone. Um, we've seen some scions of public relations ethics break their own rules. Um, so it's been a year where you can see people walk in the boundary between what behavior is ethical and what behavior is unethical. That always seems to be a moving target, particularly in a business environment where um, Profit is the bottom line, and the pressure to make profits uh, has never been greater. So um, what I would like to do is introduce our panel. Um, we have directly to my left, we have Chris Bauer, who is the president of Bauer Ethics Seminars. He travels the country um, uh, educating companies and helping them work through just how they practice ethical behavior. I have Phil Goldsmith, who is principal of Goldsmith Condon Associates and uh, certainly has an illustrious past in Philadelphia, including working with the city government. David Kirk, who is uh, APR fellow PRSA and president of the PR Guy, and uh, past president of the chapter? Yes. Yes, past 1826. president. 1826. <laughs> it was a fine year. And I have Dave Frankel, who, uh, in addition to his uh, past in, the, uh, broadca in broadcast journalism, is now an attorney with Montgomery McCracken and brings a wonderful uh, sense of experience both from the journalistic side and from the legal side. So the issue then with ethics uh, is, is trust. What is trust? How do we do it? Uh, what does it mean? Is there a value placed on trust? Um, Judith Regala and Carol Osborne devote an entire book to how companies can do trust. And so that's really the question that uh, I want to bring up today. So with that in mind, gentlemen, and if we can just go right down the row here, um, how do you define trust? What is it? Why is it important? And um, do American corporations, in your opinion, do they do it very well? Well, why don't we start with you, Chris? Right. You're on, Dave. Do they do it very well? Well, you know, I'm not sure. I know how to answer that question. I, I think any corporation that is in business has enough people trusting them. Unless you've got a monopoly, business runs because you've got enough people that aren't going to go somewhere else, they're only going to go somewhere else, and they don't trust you. So I think the, the, the question to be addressed is, are people creating trust in a way that is appropriate and not appropriate? And that gets to be a, you know, a judgment call. The RSA has some clear guidelines about things you do and don't do. Uh, as you probably are aware, uh, maybe, maybe sadly, not, not maybe, I, I would say definitely sadly, uh, PRSA's guidelines are, are the rare exception. You go into corporations and ask them uh, how do you create trust, uh, and they look at it like why, why, why is that an issue? We want to create loyalty, uh, and there's, a, I think, a confusion between loyalty and trust. Uh, it's interesting to hear, and if that feels confident to the rest of you. Well, I, I view trust as... Um, when someone's willing to give you the benefit of the doubt. And I think that uh, if you can at least be given the benefit of the doubt, then you have the opportunity to 
to tell your story and to have it heard. And so I think it's important for both individuals and, and uh, corporations to develop the types of practices uh, that allows them to get the benefit uh, of the doubt. Um, and I think that's really done uh, statement by statement. To me, it's like you're only as good as your last statement that you make. And I think when you uh, you slip up and you get caught on slipping up, uh, you start to chip away at that, uh, that benefit uh, of the doubt. And that's why I think each and every statement you make has to be uh, accurate. Uh, and uh, accurate not just in what is said, but also in what perhaps you don't say. Uh, to build that benefit of the doubt. Jonathan, I tackle your middle question, which is why does it matter? And why does it matter for people who, who do what we do? Um, there's an enormous amount of research in employee communication, in issues management, in uh, marketing, in you name the subspecialty of, of what we do, that ties trust directly to a whole bunch of things that organizations want to have. Um, loyalty, sales, uh, good opinion, high opinion, and so forth. I'm in the midst of a study right now for a hospital that has enormous linkages between trust and opinions of various hospitals in terms of the quality of the care, the technology that they have, uh, a whole bunch of values that matter at the bottom line. So from, from our perspective, why I think we need to care about it is because things drive trust. And as people who are responsible for managing reputations of our organizations and for creating trust to get all those benefits or managing trust, we have to know what drives it, what, what are the buttons to push for that. So we have to be in a position to be able to advise our, our organizations as to how to behave in order to build the value that produces the results that they want. I think, to me, trust is my ability to relax when you tell me something. Um, <laughs> whether it's on an interpersonal relationship, a business relationship, a product. Um, you know, I want to know if I buy X brand, I can trust the brand. I can relax. I don't have to think it's going to work. Windows Vista. <laughs> you know, and it's going to be a while before I'll trust that product uh, because I had one bad experience with it. Um, so I think it's, it's my ability to relax, and I think it ties directly to truth. I think they're equivalent. Um, I think if you have, if you can count on the truth, that is trust. And if the truth is missing in any way, trust evaporates. Yeah. I, I, I agree. I want to kind of piggyback on that uh, in, in light of your comment about benefit of the doubt. I, I think one of the slippery slopes we get into pretty easily and usually unconsciously is that the trust does have sort of attraction of its own. Uh, not, not it has attraction and it has traction of its own, and I think it gets to be uh, very easy to get very forgiving of folks that we in, in whom we do have trust. And so, as both the, the the provider of services to folks and as a consumer, I think sometimes we need to step back and think about: Am I really taking what they say at face value simply because I've had a good experience before? Uh, and we do that. The natural reaction, I agree, is is to relax. But I'm always impressed with how often. Uh, you know, good people or good organizations can do things that aren't good, uh, whether it's intentionally or not. And it, it, it's impressive how easily we can either turn a blind eye to a good organization or a good person doing something that's not right, or we don't turn a blind eye, but we're sometimes overly quick to forgive them. So I think we have to be careful of what the, the, the downside uh, of that both attraction and traction is the trust parade. Yeah, I'd like to pick up on that. It's something that, that you said, Dave. Um, trust and truth or equivalent. Um, what do you do when the truth is bad? What do you do when the truth uh, will erode trust in your organization? Um, I think we've seen that with uh, a number of organizations this year. Um, one uh, and it also gets into a question of leadership, um, Whole Foods, and their CEO, John Mackey, who um, was caught using an alias online to trash a company that Whole Foods wanted to buy, Wild Oats. So I guess there are two parts to this question. One is, what is leadership's role in establishing, maintaining, or destroying trust? And um, what do you do when the truth is bad? Dave, why don't you, why don't you start with that one? <clears throat> My background is as a journalist, uh, 
sort of informs my view, and that is that when the truth is bad, you tell the truth anyway, uh, because the truth is still better than the alternative. Um, and while you might you might be able to cover it for a while, you might be able to distract people for a while, eventually the truth will out. Um, and if it comes out on your terms, you're way better off than if it comes out on someone else's terms. Um, I think that, uh, that that raises, in my new profession, <laughs> Uh, raises issues because sometimes... Tell them what your profession is now. The truth. Uh, well, I've been a lawyer now okay. for, for a year. Um, <laughs> mumble, mumble, <laughs> And it, it, there are times when those two things... <laughs> Sorry. <it's, laughs> I already picked your pocket. Uh, there are times when, when, the, when the truth can be damaging to your legal position because you may not want to reveal the whole truth to the public, except you may want to wait and go into court and do that on your timetable and in your way, and not that you're going to be, you know, untruthful later on, but that's a constant tension between making a clean breast of a mistake and what's called an admission, which can come back to haunt you in a big way in, in litigation or, or any sort of legal legal trouble. Take, taking off from Dave, uh, I saw, um, was at a conference about a year ago, with, and Bob Woodward was the... the uh, the, the star journalist guest who was there, and he said the way that the, that the media expected to be is you're supposed to say we did it, we're sorry, and we'll never do it again, and that's that's the only acceptable choice. And I've had a lot of funny moments with clients who will be in um, a really you know bad situation. They're asking, "What do we do? Do we tell the truth? We, do we do we fudge it?" And I'll say, <clears throat> "Take out a pencil because I'm having this this thing is coming on, and you better write this down. I'm not sure anybody has ever said this before, so let's not lose it." The truth shall set ye free. <laughs> right? <laughs> Radical. Radical. <laughs> and to your point about the uh, truth being an admission of guilt, hurting your legal case, there are there are so many cases in the past dozen years or so of companies that have made the, the decision that they're willing to suffer the potential legal consequences of an apology or an mm -hmm. admission at the beginning as opposed to the frequently more damaging uh, uh, damage to reputation right. and will apologize and fix the problem, do all sorts of things and admit it uh, right up front. You all know that there's a natural tension between us guys and those guys, which is our, our basic fundamental approach is tell everybody everything all the time quickly and their fundamental position is don't tell anybody anything <laughs> ever. <laughs> yeah. Run away, so, run away. <laughs> frequently, uh, which brings to a point that I know a lot of us are interested in, somewhat off target, which is um, do we get a seat at the table when making these kind of decisions? And the story that, that I, I frequently tell about that is um, when people say, how do you get a seat at management's table so you can interact with stuff like this? And I say, what's the first thing when you go into a lawyer's office? And then they'll say, well, the staircase and the marble and the secretary. And, but eventually, they tell me that there's a law library behind a glass wall and they can see it. And lawyers get to the table because they argue from a foundation of knowledge. You'd never see a lawyer in a criminal court or in a Supreme Court case getting in front of the, the judge and saying, but gosh, Your Honor, it just isn't fair. <laughs> They're not arguing that way, yet so many of us will go to the table and we'll say, I think it would be a great idea, or wouldn't it be fun if we do this or that, as opposed to citing the body of knowledge that our work stands on and our ability to argue for a course of action because we know what we're talking about. Well, I I, uh, I don't like to use the word truth because I think it's, it's a very complicated word, and uh, uh, you know, and I think it's 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 confusing. I think that uh, you know, and I'll go to today's previous world. And I I used to be uh, a journalist and uh, so forth, and I've seen it from both ways because I've been both in government and in in journalism. Uh, if I see something on Channel Six. Uh, they have, they they zero in on something. Uh, what we don't see is what's outside of that. Is that the truth? Okay. They have to have four or five stories or whatever number of stories they're doing, but there's a whole bunch of other stuff that's gone on in Philadelphia or the nation or the world. Uh, is that the truth? 
and yet what they've what they've shown is accurate. I'm going to give them the benefit of the doubt that they haven't doctored what they're showing. Uh, so, uh, you know, having been uh, managing director of the city of Philadelphia uh, for several years, um, you know, and what I saw on TV uh, basically were two different things of what I knew was going on and what I saw on TV, although I know what I saw on TV went on. But what wasn't said is all those other things that have gone on. And so... Do I know what's going on in Iraq? No. Do I think anyone's manufacturing uh, the, the, the IEDs or anything like that? No, I don't think anyone's manufacturing. But do I think that there's other good stuff going on in Iraq that we don't know about? And by the way, I'm, I'm against the war, so I don't take my... But I, it it's t tells me that we have to temper ourselves and our opinions because we don't have all the facts. And uh, to use the word truth, sort of scares me a little bit. There's too many people that think they have the truth. Uh, and we end up with policies and ideologies uh, that I'm not sure really serve uh, what we need. Uh, in terms of apologies, my concern is that that's becoming sort of a, a PR um, gimmick. And we have diluted what apology means. Is there anyone that now that doesn't apologize? Uh, uh, we have our uh, Day of Atonement coming up. Uh, in the Jewish tradition, and uh, I, I, I like to say I, I happen to like it because it's very efficient. I can apologize. <laughs> <laughs> I actually had a thing where, when I was managing director, I used to give it to my. I used to apologize for everything I had done wrong uh, the year before, and I also was apologizing for everything I might do wrong in the, in the next year. And I thought it was just really terrific, but it's really not sincere apology. So I'm concerned that in saying let's get out there in a uh, semblance of truth and apologize is really nothing more than a way of hiding the truth, hoping that this thing goes away, taking our, our, our lashing and, and move on. But I am very much concerned about the dilution of a genuine apology. Um, and I think we, we need to be careful. The, the, the truth, the partial truth, and nothing but the truth. Yes. Right. Right. Yeah, I do. Let, let me offer one thing sure. Sure. that you brought up was trust in media in your conversation. And I just want to share some, some data that I'm working with right now that I found fascinating and, by the way, and not surprising because I've seen it time and time again. In this current study, which is 2,847 adults, 14 plus minute interviews, random digit dime, it's good data. Uh, we tested um, trust and influence uh, of a whole bunch of different sources. My doctor, my friends, WPBI, WCAU, KYW, websites from hospitals, WebMD, a whole list of stuff. And when you look at either trust in that medium or influence of that medium on selection of a hospital in this, in this particular case, 100% of the time, any person source is more viable than any other source. Secondarily, if, if it's a person, it'll have credibility or it'll, it'll move trust or it'll move selection or choice in the 80, 90 percent range. As opposed to an entity. Yes, as okay. a person, as opposed to a website, a newspaper, a magazine or anything like that. Right. And, it, and if you look at, the, at what are the non-people sources that actually matter, it's things that they say themselves. The, th the information that the organization itself delivers directly to an audience is more credible, trustworthy, and influential than any of the other sources, other than the, the people that directly. That seems counterintuitive, oh. doesn't it? No, not to, not to me it doesn't seem counterintuitive. It seems counterintuitive to me because I can understand the people part. Yeah. But why would I be more influenced by a direct solicitation, if right. you will, from a hospital than I would by a filtered and edited and critical well, I think that's, that's right. the first point, which is the game, it's been edited and, and is probably critical, but in a way that's not complete. I think that's what Phil's saying his issue was. And I think that reflects part of people's distrust of filtered. That why are, that's why blogs and social networks are so so effective, because they're absolutely unfiltered. And you, you know that you're getting the raw opinion. You may not be getting the raw information. You know, McKay had only known that pseudonym. Right. He wouldn't have had to use that pseudonym. Which one? Yeah, McKay. Oh, wait, 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 which is yeah. how we started with this. And I, I guess I'd All like to, to jump into that from a, from a somewhat different angle, I guess, which is uh, a distinction uh, I see 
sometimes being made in, in a kind of a wacky way and sometimes not being made at all. You know, him going online, pseudonym or not, and, uh, you know, trashing a competitor. I, I'm not an attorney, but I gather that's got some pretty significant legal issues attached to it, particularly because this is a company where it was clearly a, a long-term plan uh, for a takeover. But I, I think once you step away from that, I, I think it's also easy to forget that, you know, here, here we are in the Constitution Center. You know, everyone's got a right to be cranky and pissy, whether it's online or on, you know, in, in any form of media. And even though we might wish it were otherwise, you know, there, there continues to not be a law against being a jerk. So, you know, had, had someone else gone online and said essentially the same thing, they might have been derided for it. But I think there's some significant differences. Slight difference in, in that case, and it is a publicly traded company. Absolutely. We talked about beforehand. Right. Uh, I don't know where the SEC came down on this ultimately, but you could interpret his pseudonymous, uh, pseudonymous <laughs> behavior as breaking securities laws, yeah. because he was right. essentially uh, trying to influence yeah, value, yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh, right. which would be an SEC violation on both sides of the equation. Mm -hmm. I want to back up for a second. Um, incidentally, the, um, Edelman's trust survey, this was 2006, but uh, what they discovered, and Edelman does an annual trust survey um, that... Uh, ironically enough. Ironically enough. <laughs> um, what they found that distrust of government, distrust of media, distrust of corporations had increased. The person that the people they interviewed, which is a um, somewat narrow sample, they tend, I think, the baseline is $75,000 in income and a certain uh, uh, education level. The person they most trusted was someone like me. <laughs> so, uh, which strikes me as a sense that people, not only do they not have trust in institutions, but they seem, it seems to be pretty isolated, that only your own value system. So that in mind, um, you know, how, do, how do companies, how do corporations, how do organizations, how do they combat that when and it, right away there's already a belief that they are not trustworthy? Two ways. One is, uh, at the tactical level, it's who you select as spokespeople in a particular mm -hmm. situation. Um, in, in a more complex way, uh, in 1999, um, PRSA and the um, Rockefeller Foundation did a study called the National Credibility Index, uh, which has been repeated for different subjects every couple of years on a new subject specifically. And what they found consistently is who is credible on any particular subject shifts from subject to subject. So that you can never, as an organization, assume that you know who your thought leaders are, who your opinion leaders are globally, because they're going to change subject by subject, issue to issue. Mm -hmm. So at the broader strategic level, you need to have the right antenna in place and the right ability to determine who's influential now that I'm dealing with this issue versus that issue. So you can mm -hmm. uh, interact appropriately with that. Huh. Well, yeah, and at the risk of speaking the obvious, I think even before you get there, it helps if you actually have some integrity to begin with before you start talking about how you're going to try and demonstrate that integrity out loud. Sure. Uh, and I think everyone needs to pay attention to, uh, you know, not just the existing skeletons in their closet, but the reducing the, the, the future skeletons that might be there and talking in a, in a very direct, very open, very purposeful way about what do we stand for. Let me, let me pick up on that for a second. Um, one of the things I wanted to bring up was the the phrase that's, I think, often used and misused, which is that the PR practitioner is the conscience of the organization. And that struck me as, at times, grandiose um, and even a little dangerous. Um, wh what does that mean? What does it mean that the PR person is the, is the conscience of the organization? Are they the only conscience? Should they be? I mean, what, what's, what's your thoughts on that? I'll, I'll opt out as a non-PR person. How's that? Okay, David. Well, uh, it speaks to the, the changing role of public relations people. There's the old saw that as you look at the history of public relations, the question coming from management to us was, um, how should I say what I've already decided I'm going to say? Uh, then it became, well, what should I say? And then it became, well, what should I do now? And I think that speaks to the role of that, that, that level of our involvement in the corporation speaks to our role as the conscience of the corporation which is helping to align the corporate behavior with the expectations and values of the audience, the customer, the if it's an issue, the movers of the issue or whatever. So at the highest level, I think absolutely we should be and we have the, we have the, we have the place to stand to be 
the conscience of the of the organization by guiding behavior. But if what we're doing is special events and publicity, and that's all we do, well, then we don't get the be a conscience. Right, we'll contrast a little bit with what Chris does, which is to help organizations understand their ethical missions or, or where they stand on ethical issues. Uh, does PR right. have a role in that? Does PR play a role internally? Um, and, and maybe you can talk a little bit about how you get companies to start addressing some of those issues. Well, I think, look, you know, if, with the question reframed, I, I guess my, again, as a non-PR person, I think uh, PR has, on one hand, a unique role, just because you've got a unique position within the organization. At the same time, it's also ununique, because I think the way organizations really develop cultures of ethics is they make it clear that everyone brings whatever skills they have to the table to contribute to making sure that people are aware of what the internal values are, people are aware of what it means to bring those values to life. Uh, you know, for, for me, the equation of, of developing a culture of ethics, as long as you're willing to paint in pretty broad strokes, it has a pretty small number of steps. I mean, you start by being very clear about what, you know, what do you stand for? What are your values? You know, develop a value statement that, that actually is clear and concise and uh, easily applied. PRSA has done that. You know, I had to put this conversation with a few folks already today. I, you know, I read lots of ethics codes, lots of value statements. Trust me, you know, the PRSA approach is, is frighteningly unique uh, in, in, in both its clarity uh, and a part of that it's its brevity uh, and the fact that you, you're given examples of how do you bring those values to life. So an organization has to start with that. Uh, and then you need to make sure that everyone, uh, you know, top, bottom, left, right, in between is, is aware of what the expectations are. And you build that into every communication. That certainly uh, falls into into a PR function frequently. Uh, but you know, every piece of training, every bit of promotion, every bit of marketing, in some way references what your values are in, in, in a credible way. And then you make sure that everybody is very explicitly shown how to bring those values to life, and you just and you reinforce that constantly in folks. It's a pretty simple equation. I mean, again, you know, easier said than done. Uh, but not nearly as complicated as most people assume. I guess the issue for me is, uh, do the values come from the top down, or do they sort of bubble up? And as a, well, as a PR person, it seems very difficult to, even if you're pointing out what's, what's important for senior management to address, or to think about, or to be aware of, or to be aware of how their behavior projects uh, within, within the company. Um, it, it seems that, the, that as a PR person, you're often quite isolated in, in trying to make that happen. So what support can you draw on within an organization, uh, especially because every aspect of the organization communicates, not just the spokes for spokespeople. So how can PR people draw on what the values of the company, the stated values of the company are, and what the culture is to make that work? Well, if I understand the, 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 the question, uh, my thought would be it's another one of those places where, where PR folks as a profession are really not different than anybody else. I mean, every, every organization is going to be different. The cast of characters is going to be different. The alliances and the allegiances are going to be different. And I think we all have to be vigilant about where we can get some traction in terms of doing the right thing. Uh, I, I think not to shy from speaking, you know, again, truth, I agree, is, a, is a, in some ways a shaky term, but, but for lack of a better one off, off the top of my head, we all have to know to, to, uh, that it's not only acceptable, but mandatory to speak the truth as we say it. Diplomacy is important in that, uh, but, you know, I, as I find myself saying a lot of times the audiences, we also have to remember that diplomacy is not a code word for lying. You know, it's telling somebody something right. yeah, that they probably don't want to hear in a way that increases the likelihood they're going to hear it in the way that we mean it and, and the spirit which we intend it. And if you're doing that and promoting that, I think as a PR person, just as any other individual in your organization, you're doing what you can to try and, and promote the right thing. I see one of the dilemmas, again, not unique to, to folks in PR, is what, you know, what do you do if you give it your best shot and you really feel that the values that are stated or the values that are being enacted, you just can't agree with. Right? That, 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 that they don't suit your ethics, your values, and I think we all have to make a decision for ourselves about the point at which we stay and fight and the point at which we say, you know, I just can't do this. This is so not aligned with what I believe is the right thing to do that I simply can't be a part of this organization. I don't feel like I can do enough to change it uh, that for my own peace of mind, for my own values, I need to be someplace else doing, or doing something else. Yeah. Jonathan, part, part of your question, I think, was to say, who are my allies? Mm -hmm. uh, who, where can I go for support? And if you haven't followed Shakespeare's advice and killed all the lawyers first, <laughs> <laughs> um, that's a good place to start because frequently the issues of trust and behavior and ethics are bumping up against legal issues as well. Mm -hmm. 
and you can frequently get support. And this is just practical advice. You can get support from pe anybody in an organization who has, by the nature of their job, uh, a set of values to protect. Mm -hmm. uh, legal behavior in pharmaceutical companies, the people who are looking at compli FDA compliance. You can, all, you can go to the compliance officers or SEC compliance. Anybody inside who's got a set of values and it's their job to sort of police those values can frequently be our allies in arguing for behavioral change of the corporation, mm -hmm. new mm -hmm. programs, policies, and, and so forth. There's a great example, and I'd like you to, the, the Davids, to uh, address this issue. Um, look at Johnson & Johnson and its decision to sue the Red Cross. Uh, David Kirk, you mentioned earlier that um, you, met, you used the word a seat at the table. I think essentially is what is your seat at the table as a PR person. Um, just project that a little bit. I, I'm curious to get your thoughts on, do you feel that public relations in, at Johnson & Johnson had a seat at the table on this issue? Or were they, um, uh, it's impossible to look inside, but mm -hmm. given the way that, uh, that the lawsuit went out, um, do you think that, that's, uh, that they had a seat at the table? Well, I have some insider information on, on both sides of that. Uh, uh, that controversy. Um, my guess is that no, the PR people that that the whatever brand was using the Red Cross probably weren't involved at the table. But from the flip side, I would never take on the Red Cross. Uh, the, the story I'll, I'll tell you. Do you all remember in Philadelphia there was a Red Cross um, issue about blood collection? Mm -hmm. And it, what, it wasn't in Philadelphia, but it was somewhere else. But the Philadelphia Red Cross was under media attack and all sorts of attack. At the time, I worked. No, for we don't attack. I'm sorry. We cover. <laughs> sorry. They were covering. They were covering. I'm so you were talking oh. about honesty. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, That's the point again. of view. <laughs> Thank you for covering. Covering thoroughly. <laughs> At the time, they were client, the Red Cross, and I talked to the Chris. I forget her name anymore. Who was the PR director? I was in another state. And she called me up and she said, what do we do, what do we do? And I said, well, have you looked at the numbers? And, and any organization has numbers. And the Red Cross, it's blood donation, volunteerism, uh, cash donations, and all that sort of stuff. And she said, yeah, just like in any crisis, they're shooting up through the, through the ceiling. That's good. And whenever anybody, before they had the mess with the money, the Katrina business, uh -huh. before that, anytime anybody attacked the good old Red Cross, people came out of the woodwork to defend it. Hillary. There's a good old Red mm -hmm. Cross. So mm -hmm. if, whenever there were, you could, if you were running the Red Cross, you'd look to create a crisis every day because you get more blood, more money, and more volunteers every time there's every time there's a crisis. So uh, knowing that, I certainly wouldn't have advised J and J to, to you know go into battle about the use of the Red Cross on there. In fact, isn't isn't the use of the Red Cross being changed to the Red something else because it's too Christian and I've recently read that there's a that that represents Christian things. So even that even they're battling with yeah, the. I, the I, I, I disagree. I, I really do. I, I think uh, first of all, I disagree that PR is a consciously organization. Consciously organization is a CEO. Okay. The PR is there to help the CEO uh, understand the implications from a public relations perspective of what he says and how he should say it and, and what the organization does. But PR, I mean, I, I, I'd like us all to, you know, I'd like to flatter you all to say that you're the conscious <laughs> organization. You know, you have a certain constituency and certain stakeholders. And a CEO has to balance a lot of competing interests. I think, uh, in, in my case, PR could have been at the table, but PR is only one factor at the table. You have the legal implications, and you can't dismiss legal implications. Remember when the Olympics sued a restaurant down in Atlanta because they were had the, the five, and there is a thing of protecting your brand, and you've got to protect your brand, and unfortunately it means going to law, and you have to take the fallout, the PR fallout of that, and then the PR practitioner's job is to help shape how that fallout is going to be less uh, than otherwise might if you didn't have a good PR practitioner. Uh, but I, I think you got to understand that within a company, there's a lot of dynamics, and PR is one of them. PR is just one of them. Uh, and, and, and I would argue that I don't think the Red Cross's reputation is all that high. And if I were Johnson & Johnson, I might want to sue them to protect Johnson. I think Johnson & Johnson has a much better brain than the Red Cross. And, and I could argue that that's why I did it, really to protect our brand and our reputation, because the Red Cross 
has been sullied. And it was sullied before, except the, pre the, except the public didn't really know how sullied it was. Uh, well, but all, my, my, all I'm saying is that, you know, and I've been in decision-making jobs, and, and, and you have to listen to the lawyers, you got to listen to the financial people, you got to listen to the PR people, you got to listen to the operations people, and it, it, it's a complicated thing. And uh, the PR and how things get spun out on the 6 o'clock news is just one aspect to what a, a company does. And what a PR practitioner should be doing is, yes, people understand how that's going to play out. And, and also, we all come to a point in the world where we say, is this the type of organization I want to be associated with? And that becomes very much of a conscience of your own not the conscience of Absolutely. the organization. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, yeah, just on, on the Johnson & Johnson thing, uh, we actually represent Johnson & Johnson on some matters, so I can't comment on it specifically, but generally it raises a point which is has deep implications for public relations professionals, and that is the difference between being a defendant in a suit and being the plaintiff in a suit. Uh, being the plaintiff in a suit is an affirmative step that the corporation decides to take. Uh, you know, if you're served with a lawsuit, you guys have to react. You have no choice. But there is a choice for the corporation, hopefully with your advice, before taking the affirmative step of filing a suit, which puts them in the story and, and raises these issues that they don't necessarily have to raise. It's their choice to do that. And I think it goes to what Phil said about, at some point, protecting the brand and, and making a calculation about the value of the brand and the potential damage that, that's being done to it. So. Well, that, this is a circumstance where there was a conscious decision to protect the brand. Um, on the other side of damage control, front, we've heard a lot about, I think, two forces that, uh, you know, I think are put us in a kind of an awkward place. One is globalism and the other is uh, re profitability. Um, toy companies have really, um, you know, been in, in, uh, under a lot of pressure lately because of uh, contaminated product that's come through uh, global supply chains in China. Um, so I guess the, the big question is, um, because it's, it's more cost effective for them to do that, none of the companies that said, we'll stop going to China, we'll just improve our systems. Um, it wasn't a concern, it, it presumably was not as big a concern before there was a crisis. So I guess the big question is, can you compete in that kind of market and still um, be ethical, still behave ethically when you take those kinds of risks that can have, um, you know, pretty serious consequences. Well, I guess what my initial comment is to say, you know, there's almost never a concern before there's a crisis. You know, I, I certainly rarely get called by folks who say, well, you know, we think we might have some problems. Why don't you come in and, you know, talk with us and we'll see what you have to say. The call is always the, oh, my God, the regulators are here. We just, you know, we're getting threatened with this action or, uh, again, you know, someone, someone's suing us uh, and uh, we want to try and patch things up. Uh, or, or maybe that's one of the, the stipulations of... Uh, uh, for uh, federal sentencing guidelines, which happens in fraud cases. I don't know how many of you are familiar with that. It's a, um, so I, I don't think people tend typically to, to, uh, to well, I'd say it bluntly, look beyond profit. You know, I think people take the, uh, the, the necessary risk reduction methods, but some, you know, what, what's necessary, what's prudent, aren't always one and the same. Uh, so it is a, bit of a rhetorical question, but is your job as a PR person then to pave the way for companies to do that? Or is it to say, wait, stop, what are we going to run into? Oh, I, I that that know, your comment, you're one more voice on the know, table. Is that just paving the way by Absolutely. pointing out the pitfalls? I think you want to show the, I mean, you got the implications. But, you know, why is the Mattel situation, you know, with, with the lead, is that much different than uh, Nike and other companies that are manufacturing off-seas and paying people 14 cents a week or whatever it is? I mean, it's just... It's, it's more of the same. Now, I think there is some difference because one has to do with users at home, consumers at home, and, 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 and so forth. But it, it is, you know, we had a little brief conversation before this session. Uh, when I went to law school, you know, a corporation had three things that it was concerned about. One was the bottom line, one was um, the community, and the one was employees. And unfortunately, I think the reality as I see it is uh, concern about the communities and concern about the employees 
has has faded away, and it's so much now about the bottom line. And to the extent that community or employees matters, it's more done in a public relations context as opposed to a genuine thing. So I, I and and what I think is that it's really hard, uh, you know, is you know to to deal with these ethical issues and these meaningful issues in in a society where. The bottom line is everything. And so, um, yes, Mattel has a PR issue on their hand, and they now have a branding issue on their hand. Uh, but China is still going to be there manufacturing because it's going to pay for the bottom line um, and so forth. And I think that's what makes, you know, the society we live in today so much more difficult and probably why trust is down. I mean, you can go and say, you know, we care about the community and you can have all your little ads and so forth. I think people are a little smarter than that. I think people understand this is about the bottom line, and I will judge the reputation of the company on how those products directly impact me, which might get back to, you know, well, what, you're what you're making, finding. You, what you're making me think of is the idea of, of what in uh, Psych 101, I think we talked about, as, as being uh, situational ethics. For, so, for example, the reason that that's called the PRSA, A, America Code of Ethics, is because all attempts to create an international code of ethics or public relations have failed miserably simply because what's ethical in one country is unethical in another. Here, pay for play is a sin. You know, if editors talk to you about advertising. Oh, no, we, we, you know, that's bad. But there's countries where you just don't get any coverage unless you pay for it. And that's the way it goes. And that's perfectly legitimate. And that's part of the standards of the practice uh, in, in that country. Um, so I, th I think that... Uh, in addition to situation, situational ethics by um, country, there's also by situation, by company. So, for example, some companies really do have genuine um, employee uh, uh, programs going on where they really are a valued thing. And it's sometimes it's because they, they ignored that and they became too bottom line oriented and found that they were losing employees and was costing them a fortune because it cost, what, three and a half times to replace somebody with their annual price cost is. So, albeit sometimes because they screwed up, there are many companies that have very genuine community relationship programs and employee relations programs because they've realized it is connected to things that, that have an impact on the bottom line. Now, whether or not that's uh, disingenuous, I don't know, uh, but it happens. Let me ask you a question. I'm about ready to open this bottle of water. Uh-oh, a test. Does anyone in this room have any question whether this is really bottled water or maybe tap water and just branded? Well, does anyone have a... Does water. Any, huh? tap water. It's tap water. Tap water. Yeah. It's Dasani. How do we know? Right. How do we know? See, I thought you were going to talk about whether it's ethical to use plastic bottles. <laughs> no, I'm not into that. I mean, <laughs> yeah. I mean, I just... It's, but if you thought the difference between going to wherever they go under someone sitting under a rocking, <laughs> <laughs> next bottle, please, yeah. and just going to your sink and pouring it in. Well, that's, a, that's wonderful, Kate. I mean, because we know this is Dasani. It's made by Coca-Cola. It's filtered tap water, and that's what it is. And we know that it costs in carbon footprints. X, you know, some, these plastic bottles are, are heinous, and buying, buying bottled water is about the worst environmentally irresponsible thing you could possibly do in your life, is buy this stuff. Yet, and here we're all the smart people, how many bottles of this stuff are here? So what, how come we aren't, why did we walk in and get upset and say, there's the sauna here, I'm not drinking that stuff, that's plastic well, bottles. I was annoyed as hell, I'll tell you. No, yeah, yeah. It's true. I mean, it's, uh, but I, that gets to my I guess my issue of trust, and can I trust now even bottled water and whatever the labels are and so forth? And I, I think unfortunately that's a collision we come to, and it could be the CEO doesn't even know what's happening. I mean, when we talk about the conscience of a company or the values of a company, companies are huge. Mm -hmm. They're huge, you know, and one person, two people, three people, you know, can can ruin that reputation. Now you have the issue of what type of what happens to those individuals? Are they being given their walking papers with two million dollars in their pocket as severance, mm -hmm. or are they being dismissed like the rest of us would be with maybe two dollars in our pocket? And what kind of um, compliance and and and, and uh, 
um, processes do they have in place to try to minimize the types of, of, of fraud and, and, and so forth? I mean, that to me is the most you can expect of a company. You can't expect everything to be absolutely done, everyone to be. Yeah, I, I completely agree. And, and yet, I, I would also argue that, that in any size company, including the largest ones, you know, talking about, in essence, uh, CSR before. And, and I think. Uh, I, I don't buy that there are CSR programs that a, a CEO and a board of directors would, wouldn't be aware of. And I, I'm struck uh, how often uh, it, it, it's, a, it's a marketing function, you know, uh, th that there is, you know, you go to some of these great websites and they're really great corporate social responsibility. The, you know, the language is great and, and the projects are good. And I'd rather see a good project done for a poor reason than, than not done at all. Mm -hmm. But I, I think it's disingenuous to say that a lot of those aren't, aren't marketing campaigns uh, or, sure. or unknown to the Look, I used to work at the PNC director. Bank, and I was responsible for one of my functions was to oversee uh, our community giving. And over the years, and much more after I left, and it had nothing to do with me, just as time has moved on, you know, we used to make donations because we thought, you know, it was the right right thing to do. And then we start to say, you know what, we know, if we're going to give your organization a check. We want to have a picture taken. We want to have the right letter and so and we made it became more marketing more conditional. and so forth. There's nothing wrong with that. I agree. But it's not like I don't know, anyone watch Curb Your Enthusiasm? Oh. Did you see it this past Sunday? Anonymous. Anonymous. <laughs> where Larry David makes a contribution to a wing and it says, you know, this wing donated by Larry David and Ted Danson makes a contribution, but it's anonymous, but Ted Danson tells everyone. <laughs> <laughs> on that note, I just want to bring up the fact that it's 1 o'clock now. Um, I'd like to uh, give everyone a chance to ask some questions. Um, if you need to go, of course, you know, we'll just keep going for a few minutes here. All right, gentlemen, uh, you were talking about the uh, conscience of the organization. I put down a couple notes here, and I I'm a big believer that the, the uh, PR person really does need to be the conscience of the organization. Uh, first of all, because I think the CEO in many cases is too insulated within the ivory tower, if you will. Um, they're responsible to the board. They're responsible to their shareholders. In many cases, they do not see or hear what's going on outside of their four walls. PR person has kind of a foot inside the organization, has a foot outside the organization. So in that sense, they can kind of hear and feel and see and what's going on from their prospects, from their customers, from their employees, from the media, from everybody. So if not the PR person, who would be better situation, situated to kind of deal with those kinds of issues? Uh, second, I think we see too many senior executives who have kind of gone their own way. Uh, Global Crossings, uh, Enron, Imclone, Health South, all of these CEOs who are the ones who are supposed to be charged with setting the direction and establishing the truth and kind of just went and did their thing and ran the company into the ground. Uh, also, we look at crisis situations. Uh, you know, if the CEO is, again, the person responsible for the truth and they're only concerned about avoiding litigation, uh, they can say no comment. They can take the, the best legal course uh, available to them. But in the end run, uh, they may not have a reputation left. There may not be a company left to defend. So, again, I think the PR person is in a very unique situation, a unique role to be the advisor, to be, again, the conscience of the organization, say in a crisis situation, here's what you should do. There are going to be legal ramifications, but it's your responsibility to act ethically and responsibly. Well, I guess I, 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 I take right, right to oh. um, it, it, at, at the risk of running over the responses the three of you had to that, I, I don't think anyone up here said or, or meant to say that there is not a significant role for the PR person in developing the conscience of the organization, just that it may be a little off base to, to, to be, you know, to, to consider the PR person to be the conscience of the organization. I think that, uh, you know, regardless of what you think about how that might uh, inappropriately inflate one's ego, uh, I, I think it could also bend a little bit, uh, you know, how you present things. I think if you take on too much of that burden, you, you may become a crusader in a way that potentially could undermine your message rather than, than maximize it. Let me just say also that I, I think the issue, the ones that you you pointed out, I think, uh, underscore my point. You had CEOs in that company that didn't have consciences, okay? And that's what happened. And, and, and uh, again, uh, and I'm not saying they should always be the spokesman, 
I mean, maybe you have a spokesman that's not the CEO, but if you had CEOs that, that you know, had values that were pointed true north, those situations I don't think would have happened, regardless of who their PR person was. We have a question back here. Uh, yeah, I have a couple comments and, and then a question for, for David Kirk. The one comment to Phil's point about water is I read in the Wall Street Journal, which is credible, I think, um, that no, not in, in the U.S. They, there's a $1.5 billion spent in fossil fuel expenses to transport bottled water. So there's a whole other side of the water store that's even worse than the water itself. Um, and just an observation on the, the market that we live in is such an amazing convergence of law, PR, and media, uh, where the owner of the two daily newspapers is a lawyer who had the biggest PR firm in the city for five to ten years. <laughs> I just think it's amazing that, that uh, he's not here. Maybe he is. I don't know. Um, but my question for David is this. Um, that body of knowledge you mentioned a while ago that gives us credibility, mm -hmm. where is it? Well, um, it is in um, current research and literature. There, there it's, uh, I mean, PRSA is actually defined and continues to refine what it calls the body of knowledge. Uh, the accreditation um, exam has uh, determined, I forget the number, I think it's 32 KSA's knowledge, skills, and abilities that are required for, for modern public relations practice, which was based on an enormous amount of research that we did in the UAB over a couple of years. Uh, and we've tied all of those different KSAs to a whole uh, series of textbooks and research studies and so forth. So it's there. Um, and it, the problem is you have to go get it because we're not um, licensed or you, you, anybody can hang up, hang up their shingle and say, I'm in public relations. So you, one time you did a golf outing for a hospital as a volunteer and suddenly you're the PR director and expected to deal with a mass casualty situation or something. So I think it's our responsibility individually to become familiar with that body of knowledge and to find where it is and to and insist on taking steps based upon some right I, mean, I used to judge silver anvils pepper pots and all that stuff i can't tell you how many things i how many programs i saw that had objectives that said and i quote educate the public generate enthusiasm cr uh, position the company as the leading provider of blah 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 these were these were objectives that programs were setting out to attain um, at, the, at the simplest level, if you can't um, measure what it is that you're attempting to do it in some realistic way, th there's got to be some place you can go to find out how to measure that. That's a simple, that's sort of an entry into the body of knowledge. If you find yourself generating enthusiasm and, and educating the public, find out, well, how could I measure what I do and what would be valuable uh, things to measure? What behavioral change could I cause that I value and how would I measure that? That'll throw you right into the body of knowledge to figure out what builds trust, what builds relationship, where, where's credibility come from, and so forth. The only thing is I understand is yes. I'm in the same business as well. There's a very esoteric uh, explanation for that body of knowledge where uh, Dave Frankel's uh, body of knowledge is on a bookshelf now. Mm -hmm. uh, at the, behind the lobby, behind the glass. And that's yes. what we're missing. And I don't know that, if, if that's going to change. Well, I'm, it, I, I'm not sure. I mean, education is having a lot to do with it in terms of the degrees that people are coming into the business with. Um, but I don't, come into my office and look at my books. I mean, I, I, I'm constantly returning to a text or to a study to, to, to get guidance on what's the next step to take or how to respond to this, this situation, uh, what would be an appropriate way to do it. So it really is, my view, a very personal responsibility. Other questions? Any other comments? Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Please thank you. Uh, give her thank a you. Thank you.